And there we go, everyone. We are back again for another fantastic conversation on Friday Night Counter Attack. It is a boiling hot day midweek. The England Lionesses have got to the World Cup final. England have got to a football World Cup final for the first time since 1966. But bigger news than that is the fact that Harry Kane has left England to go and play for Bayern Munich and Neymar has left to join Al Hilal in Saudi Arabia. And the biggest news of all, the Friday night counter-attack derby of Spurs versus Manchester United is coming this weekend. So we've got you all covered in terms of content regarding Neymar, Harry Kane and this week's match day coming up as well, which is great. We've got obviously Travis and we've got Suki back who are obviously keen Spurs fans. So we're going to wait until the end of the podcast to see what they think about Spurs' new run of form, new manager, new way of playing and what they think about their game against Manchester United on the weekend. Suki, it's good to see you, my friend. How are you doing today? Oh, good, my brother. I appreciate you bringing me on again. So, yeah, looking forward to the pod. So, let's get it. If anything, it's more your podcast now than my podcast. So, it is what it is. That's what what I'm saying. (laughs) Fair enough, fair enough. Nah, it's good to see you. And Travis, how are you doing today? It's good to see you as well. Yeah, not bad. Pleasure to be here as always. You ready for it? Are you ready for this new look? It's it's been a new look for everyone listening. We're going for a new look this season, so we've been preparing really hard to find something different from last season. I'm looking forward to seeing what we've got in store for everyone as well. So, first things first, we are going to be talking about our beloved football clubs. When Salim joins, or if he does join, after he had a last minute trip to the doctor, thoughts and prayers for Salim, please. That there could be a serious injury on the way for him. So, we'll, if you make a make a wish for him for Salim, and please donate in the description below. It needs to be done. Um, but yeah, boys, Harry Kane, Bayern Munich. Last week, one of you said it was going to happen. One of you said it wasn't going to happen and is going to be wearing a white shirt in September. Travis, let's start with you, my friend. It only happened a couple of days after we had the podcast. What's your initial thoughts on Harry Kane leaving for Bayern Munich? Oh, I had myself on mute there, sorry. Yeah, maybe I jinxed it. Um, I was so convinced that he was going to stay. I was really, really sure of it, but... Um... You know, I was wrong. So I think people are a little bit too negative about how Tottenham are going to be in the future without him. But uh, but yeah, Bayern have got themselves an absolute world-class talent for sure. And Suki, so talk to me from your side of, of, of you as well. You said Richarlison would be the man to replace him. You saw on Sunday the game against Brentford. How did Spurs kind of handle not having Harry Kane as their number nine on Sunday? I mean, having a striker for that for what of that caliber for the past decade or so, he's, he's he's irreplaceable, right? It's like what Travis said last week on the pod. You can't replace a guy like that. The amount of goals that he scores, 20, 20 prem goals guaranteed every every season. So trying to replace that with Drew Tarlison, who hasn't really done that before. We, we, he's got promising talent and he shows that. But I think that clinical edge is is what Harry Kane has over him. And I think that's what shows in that game against Brentford is that we just needed that kind of clinical one touch bang, smash it to the bottom corner. And that was just lacking us. And it was prevalent from what you saw, right? And I don't know if Travis, if you obviously watched the game as well, you're just frustrated because he, he, just, he looks lack, lackluster. He's just lazy. He just stands there. And you're thinking, look, make a little bit of a move, move out the way, get him, get him behind the defender. But look, it reminds me of pro really club. Well. It reminds me of me on pro clubs, just being a lazy striker on the last defender all the time, <laughs> not really moving about at all. Salem can vouch for that. Uh, Literally, okay. <laughs> random haircut, random name and everything, just like Richarlison as well. Um, <laughs> but no, do you guys think you need another striker? Travis, talk to me. We, you spoke last week about getting a new defender and you got Mickey van der Renning from Wolfsburg. But do you think it's time to get in another striker to compete with Richarlison? Because you don't want him to be lackluster for the whole season, right? Um, absolutely. Um, I totally agree with with what you were just saying, Suki, about Richarlison's performance at the weekend. That There were little positive elements to his game, but... He looked like he was really carrying the weight of potentially being Kane's replacement on his shoulders. Um, I think what stood out the most for me at the weekend was if we'd had Harry Kane playing up front in that team at the weekend, we would we would have won that game, just plain and simple. There's just one or two half chances that Richarlison had that you can't really blame him for missing, but you know a player like Kane would have scored. And that's, that's the, exactly it. Harry yeah, Kane that's would... the biggest difference. Harry Kane would turn half chances into chances because of his work rate, because of his finishing ability, because of the diversity of goals that he would score from all around the 18-yard box and inside the 18-yard box as well. And with Richarlison going forward, is is there a case of maybe playing as a false nine sometimes if you can't play every game? What do you think, Sophie? 
Uh, no, I don't think you can do that. I think with him, yeah, you, you kind of have to stick him on the on on the defenders on the centre backs because look, even you can ask Travis watching him against Brentford, he was he was given into it with the long balls trying to hold it up, and he, he's got that work rate, which is obviously why we've got him up front right to to start the press. He's got the legs to do it, so I think sometimes we have to kind of factor that in that during obviously the first game of the season, he's 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 weight bearing those legs right and towards the 80th minute of the, of the match when we need to kind of find a winner. Uh, but again, really positive with it. You we, Again, we've got to give him time. We have to give him time just yet until he can start embedding into this new system. So I'd, I'd say probably five, if you ask me the same question in five games time. So I'll be a bit more clear on him. But I think just from watching him, I think he, he'll have a look at the back of the tapes of that game against Brentford and try and kind of change the way he kind of has his style of moving around defenders and movement and getting into the right positions for where Madison gets the ball in that number 10 position and he could just kind of get through one, one-on-one with the keeper and bury your chance, right? So, just got to give him time. I mean, there was a generation of people growing up, of football fans growing up, watching R9 as Ronaldo R9 as one of the greatest strikers we've ever seen. And now there's a new generation of football fans watching R9, Richarlison R9, and we're seeing him being Spurs' number nine as well. So, he's got a lot of expectations to live up to the name, but also to the fact that he's now got to live up to Harry Kane and Ronaldo R9 as well, which is going to be very difficult for Richarlison this season. But like you guys said, if you're going to give him hope for this season under Ange, um, his new system as well, I'm all for it. And let's see what he does against Manchester United, which we'll talk about later on in that game. But for me personally, I need to talk about my game against Manchester United. I'm glad we did this podcast two days later because as everyone knows after a match day, my voice goes to shreds. It goes absolutely <laughs> It gets broken. It gets broken like I've hit puberty again and again and again. And that was not me screaming at Rafael Varane's goal. Watch the match day vlog if you haven't already. Um, but yeah, it was just the fact that Andre Onana was our key factor, really. Unfortunately, him, Wambi Saka, and Varane against Wolverhampton Wanderers, you wouldn't expect them to be our key factors, but they were because Man United were just dreadful on Monday evening. And we were seeing a lot of Man United fans go into Ten Hag, go into Mason Mount, go into Garnacho. Fair enough, they can, because it's their opinion. But I kind of need to go into the fact that we've spent all this money this summer and it feels like we've got worse. That was my initial thought, walking out of the ground and saying it on the Matchday vlog as well. So, can you watch the game on Monday night for Manchester United. What do you think Man United kind of need to go forward to actually compete in this top five that we've got this season as well? Because remember, it's not top four, top five because of the new Champions League format from next year as well. So, five people can qualify for the Champions League as well. Yeah, definitely. I think I think with United, you've got the same problem as Liverpool at the moment. You need you need a workhorse of a defensive midfielder that can actually stay there and doesn't get overrun. And I think with the likes of Mount and um, I think Bruno started that game, didn't he? Yeah. They, they played that kind of really high number eight positions. They weren't tracking back at all. So you kind of left Casemiro by himself and bless him, he's only 32. Mm. And you've got Jao Gomez, Nunes, who are really good on the ball for Wolves as well. Cutting Cunha free, running Cunha. the show as well. Crazy. Do you know what I mean? And you can't you can't stop that when he's got three different types of players running at him constantly and he's so open in the middle of the park. But I think, yeah, like you say, you've got the same problem as Liverpool. You need a defensive midfielder, a really young kind of workhorse that can kind of hold that kind of position down because you can't expect Casemiro to be chasing bodies and chasing shadows that, that, that day when you watch it. And I think when you look at the stats as well, I think it was, I can't remember what it was, but it was like how many dribbles and times made in that certain area of the park, of the pitch. It was ridiculous, yeah. So I think for you guys, you definitely need to sign someone. One start that came to mind, Travis, was seeing Man United face 25 shots at home for the first time since last season against second place Arsenal, eventually. But to Wolverhampton Wanderers, that is a worrying sign as well. We've seen Chelsea sign um, Romeo Lavia potentially, and they've definitely signed Moises Saicedo. There's once upon a time when Man United were linked with Moises Saicedo for £5 million in 2021. Um, January 2021 as well. If there's a defensive midfielder out there that you think Manchester United should be going for, there's talks of Graven Birch, there's talks of Amrabat, there's even talks of potentially going for someone as a backup option like on Onana from Everton as well, not the goalkeeper that we've got, the, the six foot five midfielder from Everton. Is there someone you think could actually work well in this Manchester United side that would be good enough to play in this Everton Hog system? I think the problem that United have got with regards to a defensive midfielder. Um, at this point in the window is it's very much been a window for deep line midfielders. You know, Absolutely. you look at Declan Rice, Caicedo, like you mentioned, Romeo Lavia seems to be on the move, Tonali a lot earlier in the window as well. It seems like the majority of the options of players in that position who would have been available this summer um, have all got a move before United have got their act together and realise what they need. 
yeah. think you mentioned Amra back there. He seems like the best option. I think if you watch him, he does seem very much like an, an Eric Ten Hag player in the mold of his system. Um, well, it's under like... Eric Ten Hag at Utrecht as well. So it goes to show that he's got that history there with Eric Ten Hag. And Eric Ten Hag likes to go for a player that is seen before, has worked with before as well. So that could be something useful for Eric Ten Hag's Arsenal, especially since Fred has left and potentially McTominay could be leaving as well. Yeah, there's a gap there in the squad, definitely. Like you say, Fred's already gone. McTominay looks to be on the way out. I think if those two go, you are definitely leaving yourselves light in terms of players who can play that Casemiro role. I mean, all it would take, if you don't sign somebody, all it would take would be an injury to Casemiro and your season's off the rails because you've got nobody to, to to sit and hold it down. I mean, we saw it at the weekend with Chelsea versus Liverpool. and Liverpool haven't quite managed to get that number six over the line just yet. And you could see at the weekend, Chelsea were just carving them open. They were just walking through them. It just shows the importance of the number six, especially in a sort of, high energy, high line system that Eric Ten Hag likes to employ. You've got to have that player there to just break up play and, and destroy counterattacks before they begin. And if you don't have that, yeah, you're in big trouble. Yeah, absolutely. It's a big difficult it's a very difficult conversation for Eric Ten Hag to have this season one in probably another centre back, another striker and another centre midfielder, because again, no Rasmus Hoyland until September. Lisandro Martinez injured and potentially, like I was joking about last week, Harry Maguire leaving. It looks like that deal to West Ham is officially off. So it looks like we're going to be stuck with Harry Maguire for one more season, which I think is embarrassing from the club, being held to ransom by a footballer like Harry Maguire's stature. That is embarrassing. I'm really worried to see what will happen this season if Lisandro Martinez or Varane, as we've both seen last season, are quite injury prone and, and they're used to being out of, of the team for quite a while as well. So I'm quite worried to see how we could end up going forward with Harry Maguire still being in this Manchester United squad. It doesn't bring me any confidence that we haven't got rid of some of these players and we're some get, trying to get rid of some of these players on like a free or like a £1 million move away like Eric Bailly. It's quite embarrassing for Manchester United this summer. And I, like I said before, I think we spent all this money and we've gotten worse somehow, which I, I'm not a big fan of as well. Uh, but before we move on to our next topic, um, we just need to kind of ask you, I need to ask you both on a, on a positive note just to end it. Each of you, share with me your favourite Harry Kane moment and make sure it's different from the other person. Let's hear it. I'll share mine as well. And it's not an England one. So many. That's the problem. As a Spurs fan especially, I mean, obviously as a neutral, there's probably a few things that come to mind. But yeah, as a Spurs fan especially, it's really difficult. Um, I think most of my favourite moments from him were actually in his sort of breakout season. Mm. Uh, Pochettino's first season in charge and Kane came in sort of midway through the season and kind of saved Pochettino's job really in that first six months. Um, his goal from a free kick against Aston Villa off the bench comes to mind, which was when he really got his chance in the first team after that. But I think my favourite Kane moment would be his performance against Chelsea that season. I think Ooh. we beat them 5-3. Um, and yeah, Danny Rose scored, I think... Um, Chadley. The funniest thing about that game, Kane scored two goals. We had a penalty in that game and Kane didn't take it, which ever since has, has baffled me because he's gone on to become this absolute predatory penalty taker who just doesn't miss. Except um, against France. Except against France. But when we needed it, him, when yeah, the country it, needed him to take a penalty. In that game, we had a penalty against one of our biggest rivals and we had, I think, Andros Townsend taking it. So yeah. that was a weird one. Um, and then the other one that comes to mind is from... Last season, season before, we, when we beat City 3-2 at the Etihad. Yes, um, under Conte. Yeah, that was just... Uh, yeah, it was a season before, I think. That was just Kane showing his, his worth. That was him And Kulisewski masterclass as well. I thought he was... Yeah, his, fir game. his first game. Yeah, that was his debut for the club, I think. He, mm. he was, like you say, unbelievable that day. But yeah, Kane really did show the league and also Man City that, that they'd really made a mistake not getting him. Um, but yeah, I'd probably go to that that Chelsea game as my favourite moment from him. Really, excellent, Suki. Your turn. Go for it, my friend. I've got I've got two two prominent ones from from, from Kane. I say the first one will be the cliche when he brought the record. And I was there at the stadium, so watching that live was uh, was a special moment. Uh, so I'll get that one out of the way. But my favourite one was the big kind of Harry Kane kind of fuck you moment to to the league. 
<laughs> and that was when we when we scored that Bouter versus uh, Ospina against Arsenal. When we Ooh, two two. Yes, I was hoping you were going to say was, that one. Great yeah, goal. and I thought, you know what? He's when he got the mask, face mask take, off. Yeah, yeah, took it off, and I thought, you know that's what? That's my that's big. my favourite Harry Kane moment. You just stole that yeah. from me as well. Uh, I was going to say that was my that, that big fuck you moment to say I'm here now for the league, and that was I think that was his second season, wasn't it, Travis? That was yes. the last season at White Hart Lane, wasn't it? I think we had another no, season. No, it was, yeah. it was a yeah. season before the last season at Wales. Yeah. Okay. yeah, but that was like the big kind of, yeah, I'm here now, number 18, Harry Kane. And that was like, he meant the business there. And we were like, you know what? He's not a one season wonder. He's our main striker to stay. So, and look what, he, look what he's done, man. So, yeah, God, miss him already. That's <laughs> yeah, all good. And what was your second one, Suki? Uh, it was when he broke the record for all-time uh, goal scorer for Tottenham against City, last, uh, literally last season. Oh, no, just this year, just gone past. Yeah, so I was at the stadium that day and, uh, yeah, watching him score. And we beat City that game 1-0, but the football we were watching was so embarrassing. <laughs> but we somehow won that game because City's bogey team. Nah, that's good with Harry Kane. I mean, Harry Kane, just to wrap up on this topic as well, we've got 320 appearances for Tottenham Hotspur in the Premier League. And in terms of goals, everyone is talking about staying for the Alan Shearer record, but it's got 213 goals. Um, Alan Shearer got 260 goals in total and is still playing, but Harry Kane with the 46 assists, a few of his honours. He got the golden boot in three different seasons as well. He got playmaker of the year in 2020, 2021, and seven player of the months. And for a team that doesn't win trophies, he got a lot of good individual honours there um, for himself, Harry Kane. And obviously his partnership with Son Hyung min will be missed. And I think Harry Kane will be missed in general. That's why the British media didn't really want him to go. They wanted him to stay to break the record. But I think with Harry Kane on to past his new, we can only say, well, thank you for everything. And hopefully we get to see you in a better shape for England as well going forward. I'm really happy that he's gone to Bayern Munich. He's got a new lease of life there in Germany and I'm looking forward to seeing a more rounded player of Harry Kane under Thomas Tuchel as well. But again, my favourite moment of Harry Kane is all the times I got to watch Harry Kane at Old Trafford and he only scored in one game. And that one game, he decided to celebrate in front of me. And it's on TV. <laughs> it's on TV of me and my sister watching Harry Kane score a header from a corner. And me and Was my that sister... 3-0? Three 0 yeah. Lucas Moore Jose, scored twice. Yeah. yeah, Jose Mourinho whirling his whirling his scarf around at the end, um, back in the team. I was like, yes, another Spurs win. We're gonna win. God damn it, it's gonna be great. I've literally seen Harry Kane lose, I think four Spurs games. One in two thousand and fifty. No, one in 2015-16, seven, 16-17. 17-18, he didn't play. Deli Ali was a striker. But the 18-19 one, that one was when I was like, yeah, this this Spurs team is the real deal now. And that was the season you guys went to the Champions League final. And I thought that was quite impressive by Maurizio Pochettino as well. One of your best seasons under uh, Pochettino and with Harry Kane at the helm as well as a number nine. But yeah, fair play, Harry Kane. Go and get all the trophies you deserve at Bayern Munich. And I'm pretty sure we'll be seeing you in the Champions League. And hopefully, if there is a match they experienced for the Champions League to come, you could have a game against Arsenal. Imagine that, Bayern Munich versus Arsenal in the Champions League. Harry Kane back at the Emirates. We would love to see that happen in 5 5-1, 10-2 on aggregate. Harry Kane with the goals. It's going to be fun. Arsenal for Hand TV and Meltdown. We love to see it. Um, but yeah, nicely done, everyone. Um, but yeah, Scout Hams is back. I'm going to be coming back every week this season with a brand new player to be talking about. A new wonder kid from around the world. And I'm happy to share with you someone who... It basically come back on loan to everyone's favourite hipster team in the Premier League, Brighton and Hove Albion. Yes, I'm talking about Simon Adingra, who is the new winger who scored on his debut for Brighton and Hove Albion uh, this week on, on Saturday in that demolition. I think it was against Luton they won, Brighton versus Luton, wasn't it, Travis? Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, Brighton and Hove Albion, they're spawning wonder kids left, right and centre. They can sell Saicedo for £115 million. They'll get some new guy from Boca Juniors or from Peru or from um, Canada, wherever they want to shop, they will shop and they will shop well. Their money ball system is working a treat. And nothing kind of, I mean, you're in Cinco as their new number 10, which is crazy. But um, Simon Adingra is a player I want to talk about. His pace, he's got a skillful dribble around him, averaging 1.7 successful dribbles per game. And he was at that union St. Guilou's side in the Europa League last season in Belgium, the one that Travis was meant to go and see, but he didn't. Um, but yeah, there is a chance that he could break into the team with Roberto De Zerbi looking at new plays all the time. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how the Ivorian winger actually comes into this Premier League side. Because as we see with Brighton all the time, there's new players coming here, then everywhere. And no one really cares that people sell them for so much more money until it actually happens. Because Saicedo, 115 million 
Alexis McAllister, 50 million. So many crazy deals and they get so many fantastic um, replacements as well. Like the Hood from Dortmund as a free transfer is it's crazy. It's really, really good as well. Um, but yeah, I think with Matoma on one wing and um, Adingra on another wing, I'm looking forward to seeing how Brighton do this season as well. Um, next one that we've got, it's another big story. Neymar is leaving Europe. So everyone's favourite villain or hero. You rather love Neymar or you hate Neymar, in my opinion. You can't just be like, yeah, he's all right. You rather love him or you hate him, um, from what I've seen with fans. Travis, talk to me about how Neymar's left for Saudi Arabia after a good few years at Paris Saint-Germain and some amazing years at Barcelona. Are you happy with the fact that Neymar's gone to kind of Saudi Arabia and not joined his old mate Lionel Messi uh, into Miami or in the MLS? I think it's a massive um a massive waste if i'm honest with you i don't want to come across too negative about the whole thing but Mm -hmm. neymar at 31 years old still you know technically in his prime going to saudi arabia and look i know it's a building league and they're getting a lot of good players over there and it's not just aging players they're signing players ruben neves my guy neves potentially mitrovic and other players but it's not yet a you know top five or even probably top 10 league and we've got one of the most talented players of our generation who's going to be, it, it, let's get it right, going over there for money. And I just think it's a massive, massive shame. And, I, you know, I would have loved to see him, you know, come and try and tackle the Premier League. Yeah. Why not? If if the PSG are happy to let him go, um, you know, he doesn't need the money. He's been paid a ridiculous amount while he's been at PSG. I would have loved to come and see him come to the Premier League and just try and, Try something different. Um, you know, allegedly think... Chelsea rejected him because of the whole money issue as well, paying him way too much. He would have gone over their FFP with yeah. the way that they're re- rebuilding the side as well, and he would have been their new poster boy. But they rejected him. I think he was offered to Newcastle, and they rejected him as well because of the money. So when you've got this big brand, not even a footballer, but a brand like Neymar coming into your into your office saying, "I want to be your new player," can you afford him, and will you want to afford him with all the issues that he's had as well? And, um, Suki, we spoke about this. No, we we both we all spoke about this back in May, didn't we? In in Madrid, we we're like, oh, would you take Neymar at Man United? And I said no. And both of you were teasing me. You were both like, oh no, you'd take him. You'd definitely take him. And I'm pretty sure now, if I said to you guys, would you take Neymar at Spurs? Uh, would you take him at Spurs, Suki? Yeah, I wouldn't say no. No, sorry, because uh, Travis, you were just getting onto the end of your point there. Yeah, carry on, Travis. Um, I sort of forgot what I was going to say, but um. Basically, the the next thing I was going to say, ironically, is is sort of what you've just said, Hans, is that I sort of had a very jokingly brief conversation with my dad the other day about Kane leaving. And it was around the same time that the stories were coming out about Neymar being on the way out of PSG. Mm. And I said, you know, we've got the money. Why not put in a cheeky bid for Neymar and see if he fancies London for a couple of years, you know? Like I say, we, we've we've got the money, and not that I think he'd ever have chosen to come to Tottenham, but like I say, I would have liked to just see him in the Premier League, whether it was with us or City, Man United, whoever. Just you always want to see the best players in the best leagues, and I think if he'd have gone back to La Liga, I think that would have been a shame. It's a really weak league at the minute. You've got even, you know, the the manager of the champion of of that league coming out and saying how it's such a poor league and no one wants to watch it, uh, which was Xavi's comments the other day. Yeah. I think it would have been nice to see him over here. But yeah, I think it's really um, an indictment on everything that's wrong with the game nowadays. Money sort of rules over all, unfortunately. Money's been ruling over everyone in football for a good number of years now. And we've seen that with Chelsea, with Manchester City, with PSG. We're now seeing it with a whole league in Saudi Arabia and a whole government backing them as well. And I'm not, I'm I'm of that minority that's like, if a footballer wants to earn as much money as possible, he's well entitled to do it. Because if you're in that situation, you could rather choose passion over money, but money is what gets you paid at the end of the day as well. And I know people have said before, like people going to China, people going to like teams like Malaga tried that project as well back in the day. So keep with Isco, with Van Nistroy, Cazorla, et cetera, et cetera. But um, just your thoughts on it, Suki, as well, because obviously we've seen some of the best players in world football come through in this generation. Is Neymar of that bracket, of one of the best generations in, of our generation? Yeah, no, definitely, yeah. Like I, I always say top three were Ronaldo, Messi, and then Neymar, Fed. And I think mm. when you look at Neymar, he gives you that kind of Ronaldinho-esque kind of feel. We, we watched Ronaldinho when we were kids on YouTube. He was a YouTube footballer. He, he excited you. And watching him play and rinsing defenders, not making the shit out of them was, like, fantastic, right? Yeah. And I think... 
we've missed that with Ronaldinho. Then we had a ready-made replacement. He was doing bits and he was killing it for Barcelona with that treble. Then he was doing well for Brazil and I've been the leading score, uh, scorer as well, as well, winning Confederation Cups and, and whatnot. And trying Olympic to get to gold that, medal that as well. For Brazil. Exactly, yeah. Trying to get into that World Cup, right, to the final stages. And I think, like Travis says, he's 31. He still had a good two, three years left in him to stay in Europe. For him to jump the gun to Saudi, you can't really blame him at the same time because the money is it's absolutely ridiculous, right? Some of the stuff I've heard in these clauses in his contract are just, it's just outrageous, right? So, again, got it that he's left because he's an amazing footballer and he's really talented and he really excites you when you watch him. But at the same time, you get his reasons as to where he's gone. It's the same with Kane going to buy and you, you get the reasoning as why why they've moved there, right? So, yeah. yeah. And now I've got a, our start bench so of the week. This is going to be a fun one. So it is including Neymar. Um, I've done this earlier this summer at a foot golf session, so I thought I'd do it with you guys as well. By the way, Travis, are you coming to foot golf next week? I think I'm probably going to have to miss it, but um, I'll get back to you. I'm leaving it very late, and I know, but um, that's fine. There's a couple Could... of things I need to uh, try and iron out first, and see if I can get in on it. Nah, it's all good. No worries. Suki would have done a, like a Rabona type of shot as well, so that'd be one not to miss as well, <laughs> which would have been great. Um, but yeah, start bench self for everyone listening. You can play along as well. Neymar, Eden Hazard, Frank Ribery, start bench cell. Who are you going for and why? Three of the best left wingers we've seen of the 2010s, I would say. Um, that decade was incredible with the wingers that we, we had. We've had a good number of years, but in my opinion, those three, besides talking about Messi and Ronaldo, were at the top of their game for a good number of years as well. So I'm going to be asking both you guys and myself, who would be your choice? So Travis, fire away, my friend. Start bench cell, Neymar, Frank Ribery, and... Eden Hazard. That's a really tough one. Um, I think starting off, I think I would be putting Frank Ribery into into the cell column. Why? What? How? I, I, I like it. Come on, it, I like him. I really like him. But it, it's Neymar and Hazard you're comparing him to. It's Ribery you're comparing them to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I just feel that. For as good as Ribery was, I don't think Nine he time was... German champion, UEFA yeah, Player of the Year 2013, be... Champions fair, League winner. To be fair, put me in the Bayern team and give me 10 years and I'll be a 10 time Bundesliga champion. Doesn't mean that much. <laughs> as good as he was, as well, and he was very, very good. He was, I don't think he was ever really the main man at Bayern. I don't think that he was ever the, you know, the, the go to guy and the, the, you know the top player there. I think there's always somebody who was a little bit more important. Whereas at various moments, Neymar and Hazard have been that in their careers. Now I'm probably going to surprise you here. Yeah, Ribery sell. Yeah, I'm going to bench Neymar and start Hazard. I think. I think. I think that's. Of... I think that's Premier League bias. I think that's Premier League well, bias. Let, let, let me give you my um my rationale behind it. Go for it. Go for it. I think if you look at the two, Neymar obviously is the more talented player and the better player. Absolutely. 100% agree with that. But Hazard was a clutch player in his prime. And if I'm talking about Champions League final, you know, a game, a game last day. Hazard season, never played in the Champions League final. No, no, no. I know, I know that. But it's not his fault the team never got there. But... My point is... Actually, he did, I'm... but he didn't come on the pitch for Real Madrid when they beat Liverpool. But you get go. what I mean. Yeah. He's it... officially a Champions League winner, but he didn't do anything in that campaign. So it's got one to his, his name, to be fair. Yeah, but all, all I was going to say, my main point was that if I want a player to win me a mo- match, take a match by the scruff of the neck and go and win it for me, I think Hazard's that guy and Neymar isn't. Um, I think if you there's countless games you can remember in the Premier League during Hazard's time at Chelsea, of Chelsea just being absolutely below par as a team, just bang average, but Hazard just doing the business and and winning the game anyway. I mean, there's a game against Arsenal that comes to mind where he dribbled from the halfway line and scored. There's a game against Tottenham that comes to mind, Battle of the Bridge, where you know he single-handedly took the title out of Tottenham's hands that night. So, yeah, I, I think in terms of... Um, a player who's going to impact a game, an important game, I, I would go Hazard. I'm going to start Hazard. So just repeat that again. you got start Hazard, bench Neymar, sell Ribery. Bang on, yeah. Okay. Um, Suki, agree or disagree? Where are we going? 
To- totally disagree, but I, I get I get the rationale, man. I get the rationale. Like Hazard, I mean, all three of them are fantastic players, and you would you would you would never kind of reject them. You want them in your team, right? You you try and start all three of them if you could. But if I was to go with it, I'd have to start Neymar, bench Ribery, Sal Hazard. Yeah, I've gone for that one as well. And with Ribery, with his individual stats as well in that 2013 year as well, when he was top three for Ballon d'Or. 55 games, 23 goals, 27 assists, and he won the UEFA Player of the Year award as well. Not the Ballon d'Or, but he won that at the same time. So even though he was in a monster of a Champions League threatening team with Bayern Munich, he was part of that monster. He was a big part of that Bayern Munich era in terms of getting to semi-finals, getting to finals, losing the finals, getting to finals and winning the finals as well. He was a big player along the way. And when we talk about big players, um, we can talk about Neymar as well, because Neymar, he was a clutch performer I'd, I'd say even more than Hazard, in my opinion, as well. That 6-1 game for ba- uh, Barcelona against PSG, when he scored a free kick, he scored a penalty as well. And in that last 10 seconds of the game, when he sets up Sergio Roberto to get that comeback against PSG, he was the one who crossed it into Sergio Roberto to win the game. And it was incredible with what Neymar's achieved in, in the game as well. I'll always talk about the Olympic gold medal. And a lot of people in Europe, they talk down on the Olympic gold medal. But I know in America and South America, it's a really big thing winning an Olympic gold medal. And for him to do that two years after injuring his back at the World Cup, that was a big thing for Neymar. And for him to get an Olympic medal and an international trophy per se was really big. So I'd go for, yeah, start Neymar, bench Frank Ribéry, and I'd sell Eden Hazard because he made a lot of money from that sale from Chelsea to Real Madrid. And he didn't really turn up after all the injuries he had as well. And I think with all three of them, they've had injuries along their of their career because they were always just attacked. They knew that they were going to be the main threat going forward. And they're all incredible footballers as well. But I'd definitely start Neymar, bench Ribery, and I'd go for um, a sale of Eden Hazard as well. Which is great. Hey, Travis, I'm sending you a video of Ribery. Uh, you might change your mind. I'll <laughs> we'll send you a few. We'll I'll see. send you a few. By we'll the way, see. I'm... As everyone knows, I'm not the biggest of fans of Neymar, but I do respect him a lot. So even though I said at the beginning, you either love him or you hate him, I just respect him quite a lot in what he's done um, as well. But yeah, shout out Frank Ribery, great player. Um, Yeah, next up, we've got a new segment where our video editors are going to be sharing players that we have to speak about for the upcoming weekend and for the upcoming Premier League season as well. So we've got two players in focus today. Uh, One player we're going to be starting on is Alexander Izak. And how much of a baller he is. Because Salim isn't on the podcast after his trip all the way to Newcastle. <laughs> and seeing Aston Villa getting annihilated. And he said it on his vlog. So fair play to him. He carried on recording. Which he never likes to do. So shout out Salim. I know you're listening even if you're not um, here today. Get well soon. And everyone please donate in the link below for our Make-A-Wish Foundation for Salim as well. Alexander Izak, boys. Talk to me. Is this the chance where he gets to become... I'd say top five goal scorers in the Premier League because it looks like he's got the nod over Wilson. He's got Tonali playing with him and Guimera's playing really good football. Um, Travis, talk to me. Alexander Izak, what's his goal tally for the season? What do you expect from him? I think, um, you know, last season, obviously it was all about Haaland and then Kane was sort of far and away the second top goal scorer. I think Isak is going to be a lot closer to Haaland than I think people will think he is. Um, you know, he never really broke into the sort of upper echelons of goal scorers last season. But I think that really is because he spent so much time out injured. Um, and obviously he was, you know, you've got to put some of that down to him, adapting to a new league, a new system, new team. Um, I think he's got absolutely everything. You know, he's tall, he's quick, he's strong. But he's also so tidy as well. You know, his touch is fantastic. His dribbling um, is so tidy. The way you just said tidy, I was like, that's insane. For a guy that tall, his, his dribbling is just electric. I, I mean, I watched, um, admittedly didn't watch the game, but I watched the highlights of uh, Villa versus Newcastle. Um, at the weekend. And you watched Salim's match day vlog as well. You've got to plug that as well. Yeah, of course. I watched Salim's match day vlog and uh, enjoyed the Salim tears. Um, but his second goal, especially... His finishing ability is just nuts. He's he's just a natural, absolutely natural goal scorer. And they're the scariest type of players, I think. The ones that make goal scoring look effortless, like it's just easy. Um, so I think, yeah, Isak, I think, is gonna be is gonna be up there this season. I think if he gets less than 20 goals in the league, providing he plays the full season, of course, I think if he gets less than 20 goals in the league, it's gonna be a disappointing season for him. And like you say, he's looks like he's got that nod over Wilson now as the the main number nine, I think, with them having brought in Barnes as well as 
you know, more of an out and out winger than um than you know Almiron or whoever else they had on the wings last season. Same it, maximum. Yeah, I think they are gonna look to play more with with one number nine because I know at times last season they had Wilson and Isak, but I think this season they're gonna look more so at, at just the one striker and the other one playing as a backup. So okay, and, I'm looking uh, forward to sorry, carry on. No, sorry, I was just gonna say, yeah, it looks like Isak's got the nod and I think he's gonna uh, you know, take the ball and run with it. But yeah, that that was all I was gonna say. No, I was going to say, Suki, I'm looking forward to seeing the Callum Wilson podcast with Mikel Antonio because both of them are going to be out of the team this season. So they'll be talking all about it on their BBC <laughs> podcast. Callum Wilson is going to be there like, yeah, Alexander Isak is tearing it up as well. And I want to kind of know your thoughts as well. Is that a benefit now to Newcastle United having more wingers in their team? You've got Joel Willett, you're going to have um, Harvey Barnes, like Travis said, scoring on his debut as well. Shout out to Harvey Barnes. But that's going to be a lot more suitable for Alexander Isak's game, being the nine, being the focal point, being the main man um, in attack for Newcastle United. How scary is that as an opposition fan and as a neutral as well for Alexander Isak? No, nah, definitely. I mean, like Travis said, ability-wise, he's got it all. And I think that one assist against Everton kind of screams the volumes of his dribbling ability. And I think he's finishing as well against West Ham when they're batting him 5-0. It just, he's, a natural, he's a natural finisher, like Travis said. So I think he's he's got the package. It's just around kind of finalising that. I reckon one thing that he needs to do is just get a bit more kind of stocky for the for the Prems. Because again, you're playing against two central defenders. Our centre-backs in the league are quite hefty. So if you could put a bit more size on, you can win a lot more aerial duels and obviously score a lot more headers, right? And I think if he has that aspect to his game, we're talking, like Travis said, we're talking about 25-plus season Prem goal. Uh, goal scorer right for the season um, but yeah like you say man I think with that team that they've got my, my only worry about Newcastle was just squad depth because obviously they're going to be playing four competitions now is how they go about their business and I think they've done it properly they've done it astute they've brought the right players in the right positions and like you say with Isak playing up kind of being the focal point number nine I think he's more suited for the Champions League European games where it gets a bit more technical I think when you play like the Cup games the Carabao Cup or when you need to play away I think Wilson's key for those kind of the kind of grind it out kind of win kind of games. I think that's perfect. And I think the way that Eddie has got himself as well, the different formations, different tactics, he's got it kind of spot on with everything. And I think when you look at Newcastle now, you see them being more systematic. I think last season they that's where they struggled is just having a bit more kind of depth in each position. And I think now they've realised that that they needed more quality players and they've added that. And I think one one key factor where I think Isak will score twenty plus goals this season is is Tonali being behind him. Yes. And I think you'll see that a lot more prevalent with the assists that he's going to keep chipping over to him himself and Harvey a, Barnes on the left as well. What a debut from both of them as well, Harvey Barnes and Sandro Tonali. And I said earlier this summer as well that it was crazy that AC Milan sold him and got rid of Paolo Maldini. And we saw in the Premier League for that for his first home game that he settled in quite easily into that first game. He's got a long way to go, obviously. And that's what Eddie Howe does when he buys plays. He kind of follows Pep Guardiola in that first respect in terms of basically looking at a player that he comes in from a foreign country he doesn't start them all the time so he doesn't have to rely upon them as well and that allows that player to settle in and with Alexander Isak who I believe has settled in properly had a proper preseason, had that rest in the summer as well potentially looking at um, more international games of Sweden as well hopefully um, he becomes that main man for Newcastle and potentially could be one of their best strikers since Alan Shearer I mean we're talking about Wilson being a top scorer for them but since Alan Shearer realistically they've not had a mainstay at a number nine since pro oh, Callum Wilson, then you've had like random players all the time at number nine for Newcastle. So it's now the time I would say where Alexander Isak could be the guy to rather follow Alan Shearer than in terms of Demba Bar and Papa Cisse in terms of being here for a short time, but a good time, hopefully there for a long time and a good time um, for Alan Shearer as well, which is great. And the second player we have to talk about is Darwin Nunes. Darwin Nunes had a nice little cameo off the bench for Liverpool against Chelsea in that all-out attack team, it looked like, didn't it, Travis, against Chelsea, where you've got uh, Soboslai, you've got McAllister, Curtis Jones as well, Mo Salah, Jota, no, Mo Salah, Diaz, and Darwin Nunes coming on later as well. Nearly scoring from that last-minute half volley um, at Stamford Bridge as well. Last season, we compared him to Haaland. Well, not we. The media compared him to Haaland. I'm a really big fan of Darwin Nunes. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. I really liked him at Benfica. Big fan of the way that he can play. But kind of like with... Alexander Isak, who's kind of had a has had a variety in, ro in roles, basically. I think a variety in roles for Darwin Nunes has kind of hindered his development last season. Granted, he scored against Manchester United in the 7-0, but who didn't score against Manchester United in that 7-0 win last season at Anfield? Um, Travis, talk to me. Where do you think Darwin Nunes fits into Jurgen Klopp's system this season with all their attacking talent? I would like to see 
Um, Nunes given a real go at, at number nine. Uh, like you say, he played pretty much everywhere across that front three last season at, at various times. And I think part of the problem Liverpool had last season and why they weren't up to their best is prior to last season, you had Firmino holding it down in the middle of that front three. I think last season with Firmino being sort of in and out of the team, they rotated between, uh, you know, Gakpo, Jota, Firmino and Nunes in that number nine role and never really settled on either of them. Uh, I'd like to see Nunes really given that role and given the trust to go and uh, make it his own, really. Like you say, he came on against Chelsea and looked like a real uh, sort of impact player on the day. Um, I think what's harmed Nunes since he's come to England is he's had two or three what I'd call memeable moments. Go where... for it. What are the memeable moments? Is this going to be a new segment, Travis's memeable <laughs> moments? If there is, I'm all here for it. I hope not. I hope not. But I'm all here. Just... Not your memes, but memes of other people that you'll call out. Let's, let's hear it, Travis. What have we got? Just, just certain sort of moments like, you know, dodgy touches and, you know, sitters that he's missed and things. And I think people have really let it cloud the judgment of him. If you actually watch him... Didn't he headbutt someone on his, on his home debut? Yeah, well? on his home debut. Uh, Joachim Anderson against Palace, wasn't it? That was red it, card. Yeah, yeah. Um, And I think he was out for three games after that because of the uh, the straight red. So, yeah, co- just a couple of moments like that that have really harmed his, uh, his credibility, I suppose, since he's come to the league. But like I say, if you watch him, he's so... He's so raw. It's it's unrefined when you watch Nunes. It's kind of like just raw ability. And you just feel like if he can really get given a run at number nine and get given some, you know, high level of, of coaching that he might have missed last season through being in and out of the team and things, if he can get a good run, he could really make that position his own. I think he just needs to, you know, really to deliver on his potential. He's got real potential when you watch him. But like I say, it's just so raw that... He needs a bit of refinement. He needs someone to just drag the quality player out of him, basically. So, okay, do you think with Darwin Nunes, it's the case of trying too hard, trying to do too much in a game? Like we've seen with young strikers come and go in the Premier League, they've always tried to do too much too soon. Um, big case, I would say, is Timo Werner, always trying to score as many goals as he can for Chelsea, but is always offside, always breaking the line, even though he's a really quick player. Darwin Nunes kind of has that sense as well, of always trying to break over um, even though he's a really quick player, strong player as well, but he just doesn't have that um, consistent aggression in in attack for, for Liverpool Football Club. But where can you see Darwin Nunes going right this season from your point of view, if he does go right from your point of view? Look, listen, I, I, again, what Travis has said, he's kind of speaking volumes. We watched him live at the Tottenham ground when they beat us 2-1. And this guy caused us problems when you watch him. It's something that you've got to keep an eye on him with Nunes. When he's off the ball, his positional play and he's off the movement, off defenders is absolutely crucial. Mm-hmm. And the way he kind of peels off defenders without even then realising where he's where he's gone, it's, it's absolutely crazy. And I think for him, there's no aspect to his aggression and anything around positional play. He's got that to a T. I think what he just needs is that kind of, that finishing touch at the end. It's just being able to finish in the final third. And once he's got that, he'll be he'll be perfect for that team, right? And I think when you look at him playing in kind of that left-wing role because of last season, because they, they had a few injuries, far, far than none, with him and Salah being only two kind of strikers playing in the 4-4-2 position, it's a bit weird for, for himself to be playing from the left, in, kind of inverted in. But now watching him this season, I reckon he will lead the line as a number nine and you'll see a different newness to what you saw last season. I think this this guy, with, uh, honestly, you have to watch him when he's off the ball because he, he's so good when he's away from defenders, the runs that he makes in behind, the, the runs he makes forward, when he drops deep, starts building up play. I think those are kind of key aspects of what you want from a striker. And then I think for him now, it's just fine-tuning the finishing touch. And once he's got that, we're talking about a danger striker in the Premier League. I'm looking forward to it because, again, it's a contrast in emotion from these two strikers we spoke about, Alexander Izak, who started quite well this season and had a decent season last season. Statistically speaking, Darwin Nunes did have a good season last season. I think with when you look at it from a certain lens, from the media view of Harlem versus Nunes straight away, he had a bad season. But when you look at it objectively, new 70, 80 million pound striker in the Premier League, um, got loads of attackers already at Liverpool as well. I don't even think Jurgen Klopp knows his, his best front three yet as well with like um, Gatko, Yotta, Salah. Um, there's literally going to be Sobasai who can play left, but will play centre mid as well. And Darwin Nunes as well. 
and Luis Diaz obviously back from injury. So I'm looking forward to seeing what Darwin Nunes has to bring this season. There's a lot that he can bring. And like Suki said, got to watch out for his positional play against some of these defensive teams that have a high line because he's someone that could probably take on quite a lot of defenders and defences in the Premier League. Just got to get that composure in front of goal. And I think he'll be scoring a lot of goals this season. But last question on the segment, who scores more goals? Darwin Nunes or Alexander Isak this season? Travis. Um, on instinct, I'm going to go for Isak. Uh, I think the, the only other thing I wanted to say about Nunes is I think at some point there will be a tipping point with him. I think there'll be a, almost just one moment where everything falls into place and I think he'll just start scoring goals like crazy. If that happens in the first few weeks of the season, could be Nunes. But um, no, I'm going to go Isak. Agree or disagree, Suki? Yeah, I'll have to go for Isak. I think with Liverpool, and I think the, I think it was an unpaired comparison with Haaland. You're talking about City, who are a team that are just constant rotation. They've got one of the best managers out there. They've got the quality. Liverpool and were kind of the rebuilding phase from what they had from 2018, 2019. Yeah. So I think it was a bit of an unfair comparison. But I think for this year, Liverpool are still trying to find their feet. I think Isak is already in kind of a kind of systematic build with Newcastle. I think he'll probably score a lot more goals than Nunes this season, but not by not by so much. I reckon. I reckon it'll be close. Yeah, that's good. Um, I'm going to disagree with both of you for the sake of variety. I've always backed Darwin Nunes to be a fantastic striker. And I do love Alexander Isak so much so I wanted him at Manchester United. And I want everyone at Manchester United. You know me. I'm like I'm like the Qataris who should have been buying Manchester United by now. But um, the Glazers, as we protested on Monday, are still there, unfortunately. But yeah, I think Darwin Nunes in this Liverpool side, if they get a holding midfielder in who can hold it down with the likes of McAllister, Slobberslai, Curtis Jones in that midfield for, for Liverpool this season, I think Darwin Nunes will hit it off. And I think we will see, like Travis said, a tipping point for the Uruguayan international as well. And I think he will be the future of Uruguayan football for years to come, which would be great. Um, but yeah, nice segment there. And finally, just to wrap up our podcast, we're now going back into tactical analysis and we're going to be talking about three different games across Europe. So this is obviously something that, again, is quite new for us, but we do like talking about football games in detail for the weekend coming up. So we've got one game from the Premier League. I think it's quite obvious which one we're talking about, as we mentioned it earlier. One game from the Bundesliga and one game from La Liga as well. And even though Xavi says no one watches our league, we're still going to preview a game from their league. So I'm ready for it. And we're going to start off with you know what, I'll let you guys, um, actually no, we'll start off with the main one. It's Manchester United away to Tottenham Hotspur on Saturday evening, where I think Manchester United will absolutely get dominated in midfield. We are going to lose so badly that I'll not want to turn up on next week's podcast and I'll have <laughs> both Suki and Travis gleaming with joy because their one season wonder, Harry Kane, who turned into like an eight season wonder, has left the club and they still beat us without Harry Kane. Um, which ain't great at all. But yeah, realistically speaking, I'm quite worried for this Manchester United side. Um, realistically speaking, we need to play someone like McTominay next to Casemiro if we have any chance of surviving this insane energy that's come out from Ange's Tottenham Hotspur side. Like Travis, talk to me. With this side that you've got against Manchester United, seeing both teams on match day one, how are you feeling? And are you feeling quite confident about getting a result against Manchester United? Kind of like you did last season in that 2-2 um, draw at White Hart Lane. Um, I'm feeling confident. I think I'm really, really excited to see what Ange's system looks like against a team uh, that play the way that Man United do. Um, yeah. We were talking about, obviously, Richarlison earlier on in the pod. And uh, the one thing I would say that we, we didn't say at the start was that that game against Brentford really wasn't um, the game for him. So the, the way Richarlison plays his best football is, is of course, getting in behind. Um, he's not really a hold-up striker. He's not really a ball-into-feet striker. And with the way Brentford defended a low block, he had to do that. But with the way United defend, with this high line and you know getting bodies up the pitch, I think there's going to be space in behind for Son, for Richarlison, if he starts. Um, and I think we've got players in Madison and Kulisevsky who can really pick a pass and, and, and unlock that defence and if we can get Richarlison and Son in behind, which we didn't really manage to do against Brentford, they never really got any decent chances, which is sort of evidenced by our two goals being scored by defenders. Like you say, it could be a really, really difficult day for Man United. I think the midfield battle is going to be key. Um, I'd like to see us start with uh, Basuma and Skip again. I think if, if you guys are going for uh, Casemiro, Mount and Fernandez, I'd like two players in that midfield who can 
um, you know, sit a little bit deeper and win the ball and things. But yeah, I think you, you could be right. I think the midfield battle is going to be really, really key. If Pesuma plays the way that he did against um, Brentford, and if your midfield play the way they did against Wolves, he's going to absolutely destroy the, that midfield. Because yeah, Casemiro, Mount, Fernandez. I wasn't impressed with them against Wolves on Monday. I thought... Were Neither really were lucky. us. We were, we were booing and, and jeering yeah. some of these players as, as they were leaving. <laughs> was, never seen Old Trafford like that after a win in the Premier League. So don't worry, we're in the same boat here about Mason Mount and Casemiro and Bruno in that midfield because they were shocking, unfortunately, on Monday. Hopefully my tune changes by Saturday night. And I'm like, yes, we won. Amazing. But it's going to take time to fix that midfield, I think. Um, yeah, the only other thing I would say is I think if United have been playing a team who can score goals, which Wolves are not, Mm. Um, they'd have lost that game. Now, I've I'd won. like I'd like to think that we could be a team like that, but my worry this season is we might well struggle for goals because Kane obviously was our main goal scoring force. But I think a lot of people don't realise how many times he put the ball on a plate for Son to score. So I would imagine that not only were you losing thirty goals from Kane in the Prem last season, we're going to lose quite a large portion of Son's goals as well and it just makes me wonder where they're going to come from I think like I say against Brentford we looked a little bit toothless up front both goals coming from defenders but if we, look if Richarlison's on form and Son turns up it, we, it could be a demolition especially in front of the home crowd and I just know as well the home crowd are going to be well behind Ange because the fans are backing in big time I think they want to see attacking football they want to see us playing a high line and exciting the crowd and stuff so they're going to be well behind him. I think the atmosphere is going to be special at the weekend. So, Suki, are you going to all that's combined? Yeah, could be trouble. Sorry, I was going to say, Suki, are you going to the game on Saturday? No, no, I'm not. I'm not going this uh, this season. I'll probably get my. Uh, I'll probably go to the games towards December time. Mm. Uh, so yeah, probably go down around about then. But again, I'll I'll say to Travis whenever he wants to go down, let me know. We can drive down and go and drive back up. I don't mind doing that. Nice uh, done. More yeah, match day vlogs for, for more match day vlogs for us, which would be good fun. But I've got a couple of tactical battles here to kind of um watch out for as well. One would be Emerson Royale versus I would say Garnacho, because I feel like Rashford will start as number nine again, unfortunately. But I hope Sancho starts on this num on this left hand side. Another one will be Mason Mount versus James Madison in that midfield as well, because Mount will have to drop back after his performance um, against Wolves. And it wasn't a bad performance per se. It's just he's always pressing from the front, but he's very slow to get back because he doesn't have that pace against him. And the third battle I've kind of got to go for is Son Heung Min versus Aaron Wan-Bissaka. So out of those three kind of key tactical battles, from my opinion, um, Suki, where do you think the game could be won or lost from your point of view? I think it's just down to midfield. I think we, we, we've both got issues there. Uh, we've obviously improved in our areas position. I think for us, like Travis said, it's just finishing. And I think with you guys, it's again having the legs in the midfield. And I think that's going to be the emphasis of the way that the way that we press up the pitch and kind of dominate from attacking wise and push pushing your team back. I think that's what's going to be key for us. And I just don't think United have got the legs in the midfield to, to cope with us. Uh, but again, it's always United. It only takes his one ball over the top to Rashford to score, which he does against us how many times? So, um, yeah, you just got to be cautious on the counter-attacks. And I think that was prevalent against Brentford when we got caught on the counter-attacks twice. So, I think with, like you say, Granacho and Emerson Royal, we've got to be careful because the way that we play with the, the we play with inverted fullbacks now. So, we're doing the whole pep system now. So, it's it's totally different to the battles that we're going to see. Emerson so, yeah. Royale as an inverted fullback. I never thought I'd see the day. Or he was good, you know. Yeah, I've, 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 said, I've said it all along. Travis will know on, a, on one of our group chats. I said Emerson Royale is a decent player. And now that he is as well, people are calling him King Emerson. And I'm not loving decent, it. Mate. It's only one game, man. He's not, no, he's to, not decent. To be, to be fair to him, since the turn of the year, he has been good, to be fair. as you know, I'm probably his, his biggest hater and have been since we signed him. But not in a racial year, way. You, not in a, no, of course not. But <laughs> if, since, since the turn of the year, you can't doubt that He's been one of our better players, um, especially against Brentford. He he was really, really good, to be fair. I think it was only really Basuma who had a better game. So much nah, so Travis, that Matt Doherty had trust to me. leave. Yeah, nah, trust me, his, his attention span, he ball watches too much. And I think that's, 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 that's what's going to kill us on counter-attacks. You saw it against Brentford, he did it four times. He was just watching the ball to come to him. 
Yeah, we'll, we'll see, see as the season goes on, I suppose. We'll yeah. see how he goes, but he's, he's whack, honestly. You need to get rid of him. <laughs> Go on, boys. No no more tactical analysis. Just score predictions only, then we're on to the next game. Score prediction for me, Tottenham versus Manchester United. I'm going to go for a 2-2 draw. I think Tottenham will start well and we'll have to claw something back in the dying embers of the game. And it'll be like some dodgy VAR decision. But for us in our <laughs> favour at Manchester United to get a penalty <laughs> and Bruno Fernandes will hop, skip and jump and score a penalty. And if it happens, I'll clip it, obviously. Um, Travis, score prediction. I think it's a tough one. I think it'll either be a really high scoring game or a really low scoring game. I don't feel like it's going to be a, a 2 1 or a 2 2 or anything like that. I think it's going to be either 1 0 or 4 3. Um, I'm going to go 1 0 Tottenham. I think we've both got problems scoring goals, but yeah, 1 0 Tottenham, I think. Suki, score prediction. <sighs> I was I was predicting a one one, but I think Travis is giving me some optimism now. You know, ah, you Emerson know, Royale gave you the optimism. Nah, nah, I'll stick I'll stick with the one one. I think we'll probably score early in the game, and then United in the seventieth minute, one ball over the top, Rashford will score one one. I can see that happening, like a lapse in concentration. I could see us dominating, absolutely dominating, being the better team for you know eighty nine minutes out of the ninety. But yeah, just a lapse in concentration, ball over the top, like you say, Emerson ball watching. Rashford getting in behind. I could really, yeah, I could see that happening to be fair. But I'm going to stick with mine and go 1 0. Literally, what happened with the Wolves game against Manchester United just didn't happen for Wolves and laps of concentration. And Varane came in back post and scored, which was nice indeed. Now we're off to the Bundesliga. So I'm talking about a game that is going to, I think it's the start of the Bundesliga this weekend, which will be insane. I'm looking forward to speaking to some more Bundesliga guests, um, people that work in the football media in Germany as well. I'm looking forward to hearing from them this season as well. Our friends over in Germany who listen to our podcast, a so shout out to you guys. We're doing this because we're going to get more, more in tune with football around the world. So it'll be great from our point of view. Bayer Leverkusen are hosting RB Leipzig, who recently ended Kingsley Coman's record of winning every Super Cup at the beginning of the season and continued Harry Kane's awful trophy drought as a professional footballer as well. So it goes to show RB Leipzig are not here to mess around this season with strike a strike force with Lewis Appender, their new record signing, and Timo Werner coming into it as well. Danny Omo almost scoring a hat-trick against Bayern Leverkusen. Xabi Alonso's Bayern Leverkusen with some of the players that they've lost in well, the main player they've lost is Musa Diaby this season, but they've gained Alejandro Grimaldo from Benfica, football manager legend if you play that, or FIFA career mode legend if you play that as well. Arsenal's Granit Xhaka has moved to Bayern Leverkusen as well. But I'm really looking forward at some of these wonder kids that are going to be playing. You've got Florian Wirtz, who's their new number 10 on, on the back of their shirt. Glad I didn't buy his shirt last season because that had been Wirtz 27. And we've got Xavi Simmons, who's on loan from PSG after moving from PSV back to PSG and on loan to RB Leipzig. So Suki and Travis, I know you may not watch Bundesliga football, but is there anything from this game, Travis, that you're looking forward to watching? Any players in particular or any kind of system that um, you're looking out for from rather Marco Rose or Xabi Alonso, respectively? We've looked at uh, Xabi Alonso together a few times last season, to be fair, haven't we? And Quite we fascinating. Both... It's free yeah. for free. Yeah, definitely. I think with that, that system that he employs, we, we've both been quite excited about it. I think... It'll be interesting to see how they cope with the loss of DRB. Um, but I'll also be interested to see how they get on with uh, a full season in the Bundesliga under uh, Alonso. Mm. So obviously he came in partway through the season last season, didn't he? And I yeah. think, am I right in thinking they'd lost all but one game or all but two games or something? All but two, because I was at one of the two games that they didn't lose and they drew to her to Berlin in Berlin. Yeah. My wife will never forgive me for taking me to a game where they drew. And she was like, I don't even care who the teams are. I wanted to see a win. They were great goals in the game, but the, the fans were being abusive to their players and to their manager. Shout out Callum hudson Doy for one of the worst loan spells <laughs> I've ever seen in the Bundesliga history as well. Which is it's, it's insane. It's not even registered at Chelsea this season, I think, as well. It's just going to get released or something, from what I can see as well. Um, but yeah, Jabby Alonso really did turn them around because their main player, Patrick Schick, got injured halfway through the season. So their 3 for 3 which we found fascinating, Suki, was the fact they played two attacking midfielders and a winger as their front three. So they didn't really need to have a uh, focal point as a number nine. You had Florian Wirtz coming back from injury. You had Adam Hozek. Well, I'm a big fan of as well from the Czech Republic. We had Musa Diaby, who was um, a big factor in that uh, Bayern Leverkusen side. And you had Asmoon and you had Adli, some of the younger strikers coming through. Asmoon, we saw at the World Cup in, in Qatar for Iran, respectively, as well. But I, I really think with this Bayern Leverkusen side under Xabi Alonso, they will go far this season. They will hit their top four, their top fives. 
Um, the fact that they got knocked out of the Europa League semi-final last season to Roma and that Roma lost to Sevilla as well. It shows that they did quite well without their main man, Patrick Schitt. But um, Suki, what do you know about RB Leipzig as well? With some of their players, with the way that they sell players all the time as well. Are you looking forward to seeing some of this Bundesliga football this season? Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. And I think watching Bayer Leverkusen in the Europa League last season going deep into knockout stages. And I think when you watch them against Roma, the way they dominated them in the, in the first two games. But look, Roma were at... Um, Absolute with the way that they defended. And when you watch uh, the way that Xavi Alonso set up that team, tactically, he knew that Rome were going to be defensive. And the way he pushed those two wing-backs further up, and then he had Jonathan Tartup so be sitting back to, to counteract the counter-attacks and he's, two, he's one defensive DM sitting in, sitting in. Mm. So I think he, he's, his tactical analysis and like what you what you see from Xavi Alonso is really key. I think with this game against RB Leipzig, you're going to see Leipzig tacking a lot more from what you saw them against Bayern. And I think you'll watch um, Javi Lonzo setting up a bit more of a defensive kind of solid team with like a four at the back with a 4-3-3 or a 4 2 3 one maybe. But I think when you watch, it's going to be a cracking game to say the least, but one player to watch out for is to see how Javi Simmons copes. I think now he's kind of elevated his game. I think this is the next step in his career to start showing what he's about, especially German league. It's probably better than obviously the Dutch league, right? So yeah. let's see what he, let's see what he's about, right? And like, look, Daniel almost got a hat trick against Bayern. He's on absolute fire. So it'll be an interesting game. But I think you'll see Lies big attack a lot more, uh, and I think you'll see Bayern Leverkusen sitting back a bit and just taking the taking the blows. No homo. No homo, indeed. That's what we like to hear. Um, but yeah, Xavi Simmons and Florian Wirtz. Out of out of both of them, who do you think is gonna have the best season? I personally think Florian Wirtz will have the better season in terms of stats, in terms of impact, in terms of influence for his side as well. With RB Leipzig, they have a lot of attacking creative flair um in their side. So Xavi Sim- Simmons, I think, will be in and out of the side, starting a lot of games as well. Like Suki said, the German league is an elevation from the, the Dutch league that we saw last season with PSV um as well. Travis. Javi Simmons, Florian Works, who are you going for to have a better season this um this season in the Bundesliga? I'm back in uh Wirtz this season. I think as we know, he spent a lot of last season on the sidelines, got quite a nasty injury, didn't he? Um mm-hmm. so I think he's he's gonna come back this season really wanting to uh you know grab a hold of of that squad and and you know secure himself as as the top guy in the Leverkusen team. Um, and he really could be the difference between, you know, finishing in those Champions League places and, and not doing. Uh, so I'd like to see him, uh, you know, thrive this season, get a run of games, stay fit. And I think he's going to have, like I say, a bit of a bit of a point to prove after spending a lot of last season out. I do Absolutely. also think as well, we could be looking at um, the next big transfer with 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 Verts. I think if he has a, a good season this year and really... Um, shows that he's still the same player despite the nasty injury he's had last season. I think you're going to see a lot of big clubs on alert. I think probably City will be looking for an attacker midfielder in the next sort of 12 months or so. Um, so I think you, you could see a big move for him and I hope he gets it, to be fair, because he'll deserve it. Yeah, I want him at Man United as always because we always need another attacker midfielder with Van der Beek, Mount, Eriksson and Bruno Fernandes. We definitely need another one as well. I think Florian Watts would do wonders at uh, Barcelona, personally. I think it would be amazing if he was to play. He plays a very... Similar game to Iniesta um, as well. Very technical, very f- um, foot to ball, but a lack of pace. A lot of attacking midfielders have, but Florian Wirtz does not have a lack of pace, I assure you um, as well. But yeah, Suki, Florian Wirtz, Xavi Simmons, who's going to have a better season and then your score prediction for this game. I'm going with Xavi Simmons. I think the way that life's big is set up and they've been, about, they've been around the block, right? They've been in the Champions League qualification rounds and I think that game management of playing a Wednesday, Saturday, Sunday, and I think with Leverkusen now playing a Thursday, Sunday, it's going to be a heavy load on Wirtz, especially coming back from an injury. I think it'll be a bit too much for him. Unless Xavi Alonso kind of manages his, his kind of game load in terms of matches, I think we'll probably see Xavi Simmons scoring a lot more goals, getting a more assists. But that's just down to kind of team, tactical, kind of setup, right? But yeah. Wirtz is a starting plan, but I'd, I'd have to choose Xavi Simmons on this one. I think he'll start elevating himself. Nah, it's all good. Score prediction for me, I'm going to go for a 3-1 RB Leipzig away win. Um, for this one as well. Marco Rose setting up his team up to win, to counter and to play some entertaining football. Travis, score prediction for Leverkusen versus RB Leipzig. I'm going for 2-0 Leipzig. Like Suki said, they've been around the block. They've got that game management ability. I think we saw that against uh, Bayern at the weekend. I think you've seen really how dangerous Leipzig could be this season. Um, I think they're just going to have too much for Leverkusen. Yeah, 2-0. Suki, score prediction? I'll go with another 3 though. Leipzig, yeah, why not? Easy as can be, easy as can be. And our final game to talk about this week 
oh, this weekend coming up is Real Betis versus Atletico Madrid. Yes, boys, we are talking about one of the two teams we went to see their stadium in Spain um, when we went on our trip back in May. So we've got to represent Atletico Madrid in some way um, this season on our podcast as well. But yeah, Real Betis have uh, well, signed Isco on a free transfer and he had a really good game on the weekend after um, they beat Villarreal away and Isco had a big pl- um, part to play in their attack in their build-up as well. He's fantastic. I think you had William Jose as one of their scorers as well, which is insane. They lost key players last season in, in Canales. They lost... Um, uh, Raul Garcia as well, which is crazy to see. But Iose Perez completed his full transfer from Leicester City to Real Betis. And after their Europa League campaign last season, they're looking pretty good. And I'm looking forward to seeing what they can bring this season. But as we know, with Atletico Madrid, with Don Simeone, with Don Travis, with Don Suki, with Don Hams, we all played the role of Simeone last season. But the main man, the main manager, in my opinion, um, out of the out of all of the fashionistas we can see in world football is Diego Simeone with all the black. I know Pochettino wears it, but he's at Chelsea and they're relevant now. But yeah, Simeone's back. He's got Griezmann firing. He's got Memphis Depay firing from from all places now after a 3-1 or a 4-1 victory at home last weekend as well. So you're in tune from Leicester making his debut as well. What is it with Leicester players going off to, to Spain? That's a good alternative going from Leicester, Midlands in the UK, all the way off to sunny Spain to play football. More players should do that in my opinion. But yeah, um, Suki, we'll start with you on this one. If you're Atletico Madrid, I want to kind of hear your thoughts in terms of how Jao Felix especially gets back into this first team because I personally don't think he will when you've got Morata scoring. Yes, Morata's even scoring. You've got Griezmann, Memphis Depay, all kind of scoring as well. No more Matt Doherty, unfortunately, but they've got Cesar Spiliqueta back into their um, starting eleven straight away, I would say. What are your thoughts on Atletico Madrid this season? Oh, mate, I don't know if you if you guys watched the game last week, mm. Atletico Madrid, mate, they were absolute flames. I think you, you don't expect them to play the way that they did. And I think Travis, they literally played how we did against Brentford. They literally dominated possession. They were getting in behind. They scored a bunch of goals. They were keeping hold of the ball. The quality was just showing. Usually we see Simeone with a kind of flat back defensive line, keeping the ball now and again. But you, you start to see his kind of tactical awareness now when they're playing against kind of smaller teams in La Liga. And they're starting to dominate them and starting to score kind of 4-0, four, 5-0. Four nil, nil. And you start to see that from last season as well. They were doing the same kind of um, kind of tactics. When they play against smaller teams, they've gone all out and attack. And again, Cesar, I mean, when you watch him in that game, you kind of like he's been there for about five years. He just settled in nicely. He didn't have any issues. He had the aggression of an Atletico Madrid player as well. By exactly, way, yeah. Way. So he, Jeez, man. That Spanish passion, do you know what I mean? So even watching them was just, uh, like you say, it was just brilliant. And even like Thomas Lamar now playing that kind of inverted midfielder role it was just, just weird to see because he's supposed to be a winger but him now playing in the middle and trying to settle plays and one twos and keeping the ball around that kind of final third it was refreshing to see and I think uh, Atletico Madrid have got a big season this year definitely and Travis uh, we'll stick with Atletico Madrid as well player I want to talk to you about is Antoine Griezmann who's basically a utility player last season as you were telling me whilst we were in Madrid as well that you could play all over the pitch for Atletico Madrid like he did with France as well respectively at the World Cup but what can you expect from Antoine Griezmann? Because I think I think there's a stat that came out that he was only second to Robert Lewandowski in terms of goals and assists last season. And when you're thinking about Antoine Griezmann, all the work he does on the pitch, I think it was literally like 23 non-penalty goals, so 23 goals and assists that he got, which was insane. So, no, no. It was 14 non-penalty goals that Griezmann got, but Lewandowski was top, got 23 non-penalty goals. But um, talk to me, Travis. Talk to me about Antoine Griezmann and what we can expect from him this season, especially. He's um he's definitely got back to playing his his best football at um at Atletico, especially the second half of last season. The way that Simeone switched up the the style of play following the World Cup, he's become uh, he's adapted really as he has done throughout I, I his like time it, at though. Atletico. Yeah, he's become a little bit more modern in his approach. Um, and a little it's bit taken more the shackles attacking. off every, every every attacker on the pitch, and that's why we've seen yeah. the best of Lamar. Like even exactly, yeah. Off. And you look at the players that they've got there attacking wise. You know, Griezmann, Depay, you mentioned uh, Felix is going to come back into this squad at, at some point as well. They've got unbelievable attacking talent and it makes you wonder, you know, where would they be if they'd been playing this style for a bit longer? But um, yeah, coming back to Griezmann, like you say, a lot of people were saying he was the, the best player in, in La Liga last season, despite Atletico not winning the title. But I think if you have a full season of Atletico playing this football, um, they could be dark horses for the title this year. I, I really think that they've probably got the best chance in the last few years. I don't see 
Barca as being as strong this year. Um, and I think Real Madrid are more going to have their eyes on the the Champions League like they usually do as a club. Um, so I think it, it could be their year. And I think if it is going to be, um, Griezmann's going to be the the main man. Like you say, morphed into a, a utility player for large parts of last season. Even played a little bit at left back, but he's played everywhere across Jeez. the midfield, across the front three as well. Um, so yeah, Griezmann think... at left back, like the, the balls that he'd whip in from the yeah, David, like literally left footed David Beckham esque would be crazy the crosses that he has as well. He's really good at crossing, but he's good at everything, Antoine Griezmann. And I'm quite glad personally that he's one of these kind of he was one of those media players that would always be like a like a showman and he'd always be one of these players like a Dybala, like a Pogba basically. And they kind of like drifted away, but after his failed move to Barcelona, he came back to Atletico Madrid where he knew Simeone would get the best out of him. I just come back on the ascendancy and I'm quite happy with Antoine Griezmann in that respect as well. We've seen some of the best football from Antoine Griezmann and from France and from Atletico Madrid since he's been on that pitch as well. And that's why I went that way on the Atletico Madrid this or that for Antoine Griezmann over Fernando Torres, um, which people don't forgive me for this day to this day, but I'm sticking by it. I'm sticking by Antoine Griezmann as one of my guys. Um, yeah, last thing before we get into our score predictions is the fact that we're now getting to see Nabil Fekir and Isco in the same team. This is like a FIFA 16 fans dream come true, basically, in 2023. Two wonder kids who have done so well in their careers, one at Lyon, respectively, now at uh, Real Betis, and one at Real Madrid, who started two or three Champions League finals under Zinedine Zidane in that 4-4-2 diamond, where it allowed Ronaldo and Benzema to step top. So they're not shabby players at all by any stretch of the imagination. But out of... We've talked about Neymar. We may not see the best of Neymar anymore. I personally think we may see one more good season of Isco after being a free agent last season, being in and out of sides and not really doing it for Real Madrid in the in the last few years. But I think I'm holding out hope really that we're going to see the best of Isco one more time um, under Manuel Pellegrini at Real Betis this season, working with Fekir, working with um, William Jose, working with AOZ Perez as well. And Suki, can you tell me some of your favorite kind of Isco moments if you have any? And, and Travis, you can tell me as well afterwards. Do you have any from this? Oh, yeah, no, definitely, definitely. I think when you watch them at Malaga tearing it apart, then you got that big, big money move to, uh, to, uh, to Madrid. And I think the one moment that stood out for me was at Al Clasico when he scored that curler top bins. Ooh. Yeah, a few years back, it was like this Another guy. Another video just, to just send knew. to Travis. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> but mate, he, honestly, when you watched him when he in that Zidane team, it was pivotal. Like he knew the system, he knew how to get the ball. You couldn't really get the ball off him because he was so kind of censored to like low gravity kind of play because he's so small. Mm. You just couldn't get the ball off and he was nippy. So, yeah, and no, I definitely watching him play again, bar the injuries that he's had. That's another player that was, again, he was actually a golden boy back in back in the day. Yeah. And watching him now coming through from Malaga to Madrid. And I think he's, I think his last move against uh, with Sevilla didn't really work out, which is obviously normal. I mean, yeah, now more of a Betis, 4 2 system. So, exactly, he wasn't really free yeah. to kind of showcase his talent. But now with Betis, now he's got that kind of sense of freedom to play in that number 10 role and be a bit more kind of fluid in attacking with Pellegrini, the way that he uh, sets up his teams. So I think hopefully he's got that kind of one a couple of years that he's got left in his uh, in his bank. Because I think he's, what, 33 now, isn't he? He's quite old. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. 32, 33, which would be um, not too, not too yeah. bad for Isco because I reckon he could still end up coming back in um, to the Spain side from what I've seen as well from Isco because it's... Again, it was only pre-season, but I like to be. I like. I like a comeback story in football. Like we're going to see you, Delhi Ali at Everton is definitely going to come back into this Sean Dyche team at Everton. I would like to see. I'd love to see Isco come back again. The thirty-one-year-old international was a big player for Spain, big player for Real Madrid. Remember, he's won five Champions Leagues, he's won three Spanish club, uh, cups, one Super Cup, uh, three Super Cups, and one Spanish Cup as well. And he was the golden boy in twenty thirteen when Spain won the under twenty-one championships as well. So. He says a lot about um, Isco's career. We can't forget about him just yet, I would say. Um, but yeah, Travis, any favourite memories from yourself about Isco at all, if any? Um, I can't say there's anything that particularly springs to mind. I always did think that he was going to uh, sign for Tottenham, if I'm honest. He always <laughs> felt like a Tottenham player to me. Um, I think when he was at Madrid, he never 100% held down a, a position. You know, he never felt like he was first choice when everybody was fit. Mm. And he always seemed like one of those players who maybe wasn't quite good enough to start for one of the best teams in the world. But if he came to a team, you know, sort of a rung or two below that, he could have been that guy. And I would have been really excited to see him at Tottenham. There's a couple of times we were very closely linked to him. And yeah, never happened, unfortunately. But yeah, my favourite Isco moment, I suppose, would be um, imagining him playing for Tottenham, I guess. Which doesn't exist. <laughs> 
which doesn't <laughs> exist at all. Oh, hey, we were days, close. Bro. We had tw- just say twenty-two mil. We were very close. It was. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it could have ended. Years, it could have ended like Hammers Rodriguez to Everton. Four good games in in a season, and then it's just done. It could have been crazy oh, nah, for nah, Isco nah, at nah, Spurs. Nah. <laughs> what manager would he have been under then? Pochettino, Mourinho. No, it would have been. Was it Mourinho, or Travis? I think it must have been Mourinho, yeah. Mourinho, yeah. Mm. Yeah. I think it was after we'd. Um, I think Probably it was Poch. after we'd, we'd come close to get depart getting to Barla. Um, and that that was definitely sort of back end of Pochettino. So I think it would have been Mourinho when we were linked with Isco. Which you know yeah. he probably would have been wasted anyway because we had Gareth Bale under uh, under Jose and yeah absolutely wasted him. But yeah, no, that's true as well because it's one of those things that. It's not one of my favourite moments, but the fact that he then played that Champions League final against Liverpool and he just kind of lost that game. He did really well against Juventus as well. That's probably my favourite Isco game because everyone around was talking about Ronaldo, Benzema, Bale, whoever, but Isco still kind of held it down and he was that metronome at the in the attack because he could always go as a versatile right winger or a left winger because he was working to supplement Ronaldo and Benzema and it worked so well for Isco um, going forward as well. But yeah, shout out to Isco. Hopefully he comes back. One of the newer versions of the old number 10 I would say which is really good to see score predictions I'm going for a 3-1 victory for Atletico Madrid I'm looking forward to seeing this attack in Don Simeone as well um, which would be good fun Suki score predictions for Real Betis versus Atletico Madrid I think they get battered 5-0 ooh who Betis or Atletico yeah just I just don't I don't see Betis defending quite well well enough against that attack yeah I think they'll just yeah Depay will probably get two where I might get one, but like a million offsides like he did in the last game. But this yeah, new offside was going to help Maratta in, in the long run, so that's all I'm saying. Oh, mate, he did it because did you see him last week? He was offside like a good 14 times. <laughs> yeah, and he still got two yeah. goals or a goal as well, so he was happy with it, which is insane. Um, but yeah, but yeah. could be a riot for Atletico Madrid. Do you agree with that, Travis, for your score prediction? I think I'm going sort of halfway between the two of you. I don't, I don't think they're going to concede quite as many goals as five, but I think it'll be 3-0 to Atletico. Nicely done. And hopefully Atletico Madrid will bring La Liga back onto the forefront in terms of attacking style of play and um, saying no to racism, unlike Valencia, who love to be racist. And we're not going to talk about them at all this season unless they play Real Madrid or something like that. But yeah, shout out to to Atletico Madrid. Thank you very much for everyone listening to this podcast as well. It's been great. Everyone, thank you very much for listening. Travis and Suki, thank you very much for your time again. I'm not looking forward to next week's podcast because realistically speaking, it could be a riot for Spurs against Manchester United. I'm not holding out much hope, but that's all we can do sometimes is just hold out hope. But everyone, thank you very much for your time. It's great seeing you all. Great speaking with you all. And enjoy your week. Enjoy your weekend whenever you're listening to this. Do follow us on Apple, on Spotify, on YouTube. Do subscribe to us. We've got some new content coming out for you this season and we're loving it. We're looking forward to it. Take care and goodbye.